Now for our evening session. We have two stand speakers here, Brother Amir Abdelmalik and Norman Ali Khan. And um, we're gonna start off with Amir Abdelmalik. Amir Abdelmalik has actually been speaking at MSA West Conferences for a very long time. So we're honored to have him here once again. I'm going to read his bio for you. Amir Abdelmalik um, is an inspiring speaker and community activist that has dedicated his life to building the American Muslim community. He reverted to Islam while in college after being inspired by the struggles of Malcolm X, and he strived to follow his legacy of speaking truth to power and community grassroots mobilization. Since its inception, the Emir has always been an integral part of MSA West. He is currently part of the California Muslim Movement of Human Rights. Since its inception, the Emir has always been an integral, oh, there is an, there is an error in our program. Okay, he is currently part of California Movement for Muslim Human Rights, and I already said that. So please forgive me, inshallah. Without further ado, Brother Amir, <laughs> Brother Amir Abdelmalik. Thank you, sister. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Audu billahi minash shaitan rajeem. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Ahmaduhu wa sta'inuhu wa sta'inuhu wa sta'inuhu wa sta'inuhu wa bihi jalla wa ala wa la akfiruhu. Wa ashadu an la ilaha illallah Wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu Asalahu bila huda wa deen al-haq Wa yidhiruhu alla min kulihi Wa la wa mushrikun All praise is due to Allah I praise him, I seek his help, I seek his guidance I ask his forgiveness I believe in Allah and do not disbelieve in him And I bear witness that there is none worthy of worship except Allah And I bear witness that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his servant and his messenger. Allah sent him as Muhammad with Deen al-Haq, with the true way of life, and this true way of life, al-Islam, shall prevail over all other ways of life, although the mushriks, although those who associate partners with Allah may hate it. My respected brothers and sisters, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Um, before I start, I'd like to say that um, we have um, some nice guests with us today, and they make a point to take meticulous notes. Sometimes in my session, and sometimes in some of the other sessions. And so to them, I'd like to say gently and politely that when the sister said that MSA West is the bomb, <laughs> this simply means that MSA West is a good organization. <laughs> Islam means peace. Islam means peace. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm tired. I'm tired, just like you. Okay. Narrative. A message that tells the particulars of an act or occurrence or course of events. Narrative. A message that tells the particulars of an act or occurrence or course of events. Consisting of or characterized by the telling of a story. One of the effects of oppression is that the oppressed the Mustadafin loses control of their narrative. That as a result of being oppressed, they no longer have the power to tell their own story. And as a result, the oppressor, those who are oppressing them, will tell their story about us, about the oppressed. And it is a narrative that comprises their feelings, their concepts, and their opinions. You're going to be hearing me saying that a lot, feelings, concepts, and opinions. And I'll tell you the Arabic word that it comes from and the ayat, inshallah, that it comes from. When the oppressor tells the narrative of the oppressed, there are primarily two goals of the narrative to justify their behavior towards the oppressed 
and to convince the oppressed that they deserve this type of treatment that is for their own good. And in their narrative, any among the oppressed who show this quality of izzah, not just strength and power, but self-respect, honor, and self-esteem, then according to the reciters of our narrative, those type of people must be subdued, they must be conquered, they must be broken. And then the oppressor will take their narrative about us and flood the media with a narrative comprising his feelings and concepts and opinions. And so it was very heartening for me to see that the theme of this conference, taking back our narrative, that was on time. Because any time an oppressed people proclaim that it's time to take back their narrative, then a reawakening is occurring within them. That it appears that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is bestowing upon them this quality of izzah and self-respect and honor. It's an expression of self-determination and self-rule. We will tell our own story. It is a people who are not giving in to an inferiority complex. It is a people who are not giving into weakness. And for such a people, weakness and inferiority is not an option. And so we are happy and honored to be at such a conference in which a proclamation is made by some of the most active Muslim students in the country, and that statement is, we will take back our narrative, we will tell our own story. Alhamdulillah. Number two, it was also heartening to see the fist. As we were saying earlier, back when I was coming up in the 60s, the fist was the black power salute. It represented unity, it represented power, it represented strength, but it also represented a reclamation, a reclaiming of our narrative, our narrative. We said we demand the power to tell our own story. It's time to tell our own story because what we noticed is because when we weren't allowed to tell our own story, we were denied us. We were denied who we were. We couldn't be ourselves. You even see some of that today. You know, you have Justin Timberfake, right? <laughs> and he's trying to be like us. Even the hamsters are allowed to be black. The hamsters. You can deal with this or you can deal with that. <laughs> Man, the hamsters are allowed to be black. And so when they told our story, we lost ourselves. We lost who we were. Randall Robinson, an activist and founder of the Trans Africa, he was giving a talk to these um, Afri um, African Caribbean students in Jamaica, in the Caribbean, not far from Haiti. Not far from Haiti. And the reason why Haiti is the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere is because Uncle Sam has not forgiven Haiti for what it did in the 1800s, where slaves rose up and not only took over a plantation, they took over a country and whooped Napoleon's butt. And, <laughs> and then, as a result of whooping Napoleon's butt, Napoleon needed money. He needed cash. And so he sold the Louisiana Purchase to Uncle Sam for $15 million because he needed money to fight those Haitians who was whooping his behind. Thomas Jefferson wasn't feeling it. John Adams wasn't feeling it. None of the founding fathers was feeling that. They didn't like the fact that slaves took over a country. So as a result of that, they will never be forgiven. And as long as Sam is an empire, they will always be living in a state of degradation. But when, during that revolution, the leader of that revolution was named Toussaint Louverture. Now here's Randall Robinson asking these Jamaican children, how many of you have heard of Toussaint Louverture? and no one raised their hand. This is in the Caribbean, next door to Haiti. None of those children raised their hand. And then Randall Robinson asked, how many of you here have heard of Snoop Dogg? And they all raised their hand. 
That's what happens when we do not control our narrative. That's what happens when we don't control our story and who we are and the course of events that make us who we are. We forget ourselves. And so what we said during that time is that we will tell our own story and our own story will be rooted in the feelings and the concepts and the opinions of ourselves. That's how we will tell this story. And so much so that when one of our major leaders was called an extremist, here's what he said. Y'all know who it was. He says, but though I was initially disappointed at being categorized as an extremist, as I continue to think about the matter, I gradually gained a measure of satisfaction from the label. Who was that? It wasn't Malcolm. Y'all molded. It. it was Martin. That's what happens when we don't control our narrative. We think that Malcolm was the militant one and Martin was the, hi. <laughs> Martin was as militant as Malcolm, but we don't control our narrative. And so it becomes increasingly important for us to tell our story. Here's who we are. Here's why we are. Here's where we are. Here is what we are about. Now, in telling this story, in telling our story, understand this is serious business. Because in telling our story, we can't be afraid of those who criticize us. Because our stories are not going to have, be, are not going to be based on their concepts, not going to be based on their feelings, not going to be based on their opinions. And if you remember what Sister Yasmin and Sheikh Yasser were talking about, at the essence of what they were talking about was what? With respect to manhood and womanhood was what? We have our definitions and they have theirs. When we tell our own story, our own story is based on our definitions, not theirs. And in all due respect, we don't care whether they accept our story or not. This is our story based on our definitions, based on our opinions, based on our feelings that come from Quran and come from the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is our story. So make no mistake, when we tell our story, telling our story also means that we are speaking truth to power because that is, this is our story. This is our narrative example. Before 9-11, our narrative was clear with respect to recent events, when they talked about, you know, a course of e events, right? In 1979, the Muslims in Iran kicked out a dictator, right? Not long after that, the Muslims in um, um, Afghanistan fought against occupation of the Soviet Union. Around that time, the Muslims in Lebanon fought against occupation. Not long after that, the Muslims in uh, Palestine fought against occupation. And so listen, so that is that narrative. But see, that is a narrative that people respect. Because in that narrative, you have people fighting against occupation. In that narrative, you have people defending their homes, their faith and their family and their resources. In that narrative, other people who are non-Muslims will respect that. That's our narrative. And then on 9-11, our narrative was hijacked. It was. Our narrative was hijacked. Because all of a sudden, our narrative became planes into buildings. That's our narrative. All of a sudden, the narrative became bombs in in western cities and subways, that's our narrative. Our narrative began to be changed. And in changing the narrative, in changing our narrative, some of our own people accepted that narrative as their own. And in accepting that narrative, that story, of course, these course of events, as a result of accepting that narrative as our own, we suffered for that. We got scareder, we got weaker, we got more pessimistic, we got sadder because we accepted that narrative. And then we allowed them to couple that narrative with the real narrative. We allowed them to couple that narrative with the, with the real narrative of those fighting against occupation, those fighting to, you know, against colonialism, against imperialism. We allowed those narratives to come together. We didn't separate the two. 
And by not separating the two, we didn't defend or support those who were following the real narrative. Y'all feel me on this? This is dangerous stuff. And so be careful what we talk about when we say taking back our narrative. Yes, we must take back our narrative, but understand the dimensions, understand the ramifications of taking back our narrative. There are people who will call us all kinds of names for taking back our narrative. They'll call us extremists, they'll call us fundamentalists, they'll call us all kinds of names for taking back our narrative. But if we are going to truly take back our narrative, then it's got to be based on the feelings, concepts, and opinions of Allah and his messenger. And so this ayat, um, wala tarkunu illa ladina dhalimu. Do not tarkunu, um, rakana, lean on, support, um, to be dependent on. But the Mufasirin says that it also constitutes feelings, concepts, and opinions. Do not rely on the feelings, the concepts, and the opinions of those who oppress. Taking back our narrative means our own definitions. And we have to, we have to deal with the responsibility, we have to deal with the consequences of that. Not being afraid of the blame of those who blame them. This is our narrative. This is our story. The brother related to me today in terms of what's happening in Tunisia. Another example. Oh, y'all, we are living in some serious times here. Serious times. We said that 70% of the population in, in Tunisia is 25 and under. Shabab, 70%. And the brother said the thing that triggered this, this, this uprising in Tunisia, I didn't know that. You know what he said what triggered it? That a brother who had all this education, probably like a master's degree at least, could only find a job selling food, you know, on his cart on the streets. And here comes the government of Tunisia telling him that he doesn't have a permit. And so the, therefore they confiscated the last of his means of livelihood. And out of desperation, he wrote his mother a note apologizing to her and set himself on fire. What type of leader, leaders are these? that could push their people to such desperation. This brother's name was Muhammad. This brother knew, he knew, but being pushed to such a point of desperation that he called, that causes this to happen. See, this is our narrative. We have some of the worst dictators in our countries that the world has ever seen. And these dictators are supported by Uncle Sam. That's our narrative. That's why we have to do what we have to do in our own countries. But one of the things that you saw, you may have seen this, was when the Muslims in Lebanon helped the Muslims in Palestine, and then the, the Lebanon war took place. You saw people in this country, non-Muslims in this country, who were voting for the Muslims. Do you know why? Because they saw the actual narrative of David and Goliath. They saw the actual narrative of fighting against occupation. They saw our narrative. And by them seeing our narrative, they supported us. That is our narrative. So therefore, if we're gonna take back our story and let people know what's truly happening with these events, then we have to understand this comes under the category two of jihad with the tongue. Because in the West, is about jihad with the tongue. We don't need weapons for them. We can disarm them without the use of weapons. The brothers and sisters in the glorious so-called civil rights movement taught us that. That's why we tell you, don't let anybody come amongst you talking about, I can get some stuff. We can do this. That's the police. <laughs> right? And they're trying to change Listen, they're trying to change our narrative. We know our narrative, man. We know our story here. We know the nature of our struggle here. Take that somewhere else. But understand when you tell other Muslims, don't speak up, don't speak out, that is equivalent to telling them, don't go out for jihad. Don't go out for jihad. Don't do that. Don't you know, brothers and sisters, 
that the main way that a person's faith is, is shown and tested and revealed and the quality of their faith is revealed is in jihad. A munafik cannot disguise who he is when it comes to jihad. They can't do it. No one can do it. So when we talk about jihad with the tongue, speaking truth to power, and we tell each other, stop, shh, stop. You might as well say, stop going to jihad. Stop going to jihad. Stop speaking truth to power. What is happening in this country, brothers and sisters, we know that our role model is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger. But what is happening in this country, where am I at here? Okay. What's happening in this country is that a case can be made that shows the parallels of what's developing in this country and the parallels that took place in Nazi Germany. This is not hyperbole. This is not, you know, we can actually make a case on this. We can make a case on this. Don't get nervous. Stop, stop, stop. But we can make a case on this, for real, for real. And so what is happening, what is slowly taking place on their part, can be summed up, summed up in the words of one of their role models. The lie can be maintained only for such time as the state can shield the people from the political, economic, and or military consequences of the lie. It thus becomes vitally important for the state to use all of its powers to repress dissent for the truth is the mortal enemy of the lie. And by extension, the truth becomes the greatest enemy of the state. And so we don't need weapons. All we need is el haq All we need is the truth. Because our narrative and the story that we are telling is rooted in haq. It's rooted in the truth, and we cannot let them make us think otherwise. It is their narrative that's rooted in falsehood. It is their narrative that is rooted in a false concept of superiority. It is their narrative that cannot maintain its existence, particularly with the presence of the truth. Because Allah says, when truth comes, it smashes the brains out of falsehood. So yes. Let's tell our story, and let's not be ashamed of our story, and let's not be afraid to tell our story, and let's not show weaknesses in responding to and embracing our story and who we are. Uh, Amir Abimelech, I have to say I'm pumped right now. I don't know about you guys, but I'm pumped. And anyway, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce Naman Ali Khan. Naman Ali Khan. Naman Ali Khan is the founder and the CEO of Bayina, as well as the lead instructor for a number of Bayina courses, including Fundamentals of Classic Arabic and Divine Speech. His first exposure to Arabic study was in Riyadh, Saudi, where he completed his elementary education. He continued Arabic grammar study in Pakistan, where he received a scholarship for ranking among the top scores in the National Arabic Studies Board Examinations in 1993. But his serious training in Arabic began in the United States in 1999 under Dr. Abdus Sami, founder and formal principal of Quran College Faisalabad, Pakistan. No. Uh. Founder, yeah, Faisal Bad Pakistan, who happened to be touring the U.S. for intensive lectures in tafsir, Arabic, and Arabic studies. Under Dr. Abdul Sami, Norman developed a keen methodological understanding of Arabic grammar. He further benefited from Abdul Sami by inter internalizing his unique teaching methods and later translating his work into English for the benefit of his own students. Norman served as professor of Arabic at Nassau Community College until 06 and has taught modern standard and classic Arabic at various venues for nearly seven years with over 10,000 student, students nationwide. 
Currently, he has dedicated himself to a seven-year-long project of conducting a linguistic and literary focus for Anactive Seer series in English. Without further ado, Hermano de Juan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم شرع لكم من الدين ما وصى به نوحا والذي أوحينا إليك وما وصينا به إبراهيم وموسى وعيسى أن أقيموا الدين ولا تتفرقوا فيه كبر على المشركين ما تدعوهم إليه الله يجتبي إليه من يشاء ويهدي إليه من ينيب الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه يوغن استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين اللهم اجعلنا منهم ومن الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر آمين يا رب العالمين As pumped as I am to hear that I'm also very grateful that Brother Amir made my job and my thoughts clearer When we talk about taking our narrative back I think we have to divide the conversation into two parts the conversation has to be taken back from forces outside of ourselves and also forces within ourselves. And so when we talk about the forces outside of ourselves that are trying to hijack this narrative, the only thing I'd like to add is a reminder. It's not something new. All messengers of Allah والسلام, were faced with a hijacking of their narrative. They were portrayed with something they weren't. Whether that portrayal started with character assassination, they were accused of having agendas other than their actual agenda, or it was merely a point of ridicule, how could you follow something so, you know, so not, not, not even close to the truth. Whether it was words like magic, or sorcery, whether it was, they were accused of being liars, all of this was what? It was essentially an attempt to hijack narratives. One of the greatest examples of that that are repeated in the Qur'an is the discourse between Fir'aun la'anahullah and Musa alayhi salam. It's repeated over and over again in the Qur'an. And I want to share with you a couple of really remarkable places in regards to that before I talk about the challenge within the Ummah itself. قَالُوا إِنْ هَذَانِ لَسَاحِرَانِ The narrative given by the Mala, the, the leaders of Fir'aun, the chiefs of Fir'aun and his ministry, the unanimous press release was, these two are nothing but magicians. What am I talking about? Who's these two? Musa and Harun alayhi wasalam, they're nothing but magicians. But he didn't stop there. He said, don't be impressed by their tricks. This is just magic, no big deal. But he didn't stop there. Now look at what they go, go further to say. يُرِدَانِ أَنْ يُخْرِجَاكُمْ مِنْ أَرْضِكُمْ بِسِحْرِهِمَا They intend to get you kicked out of your land by means of their magic. They're going around to the population and telling them, not only are these guys magicians, so don't be impressed, there's nothing special. On top of that, if you do listen to them, watch out, their real agenda is to get this land away from you. They'll get you kicked out of your land. These people are a threat to homeland security. <laughs> this is what they are. You know? And so, it, and here I want to just ask you to ponder for a moment. This is the same Fir'aun. Who in other places in the Qur'an, he says, أَلَيْسَ لِي مُلْكُ مِصْرَ Don't I alone exclusively own the dominion of Egypt? وَهَذِهِ الْأَنْهَارُ تَجْرِي بِنْ تَحْتِي And these rivers flow beneath my feet. He used to speak of the ownership of Egypt and his kingdom above it for himself exclusively. But when he saw that Musa alayhi salam and his message is gaining power, and people are actually starting to listen, he couldn't tell people, don't listen to him, because he'll take away my land. He had to change the narrative and say, no, 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 he's not a threat to me, he's a threat to your land. This is your land too. Well, we're all in this together. They weren't in this together before. 
But now that he sees his power, the, the shift of power happening by nothing else but the words of Musa alayhi salam, the words that Allah has given him, the consistency and the constancy that he has. If you want to study in the Qur'an response to propaganda, just study how Musa alayhi salam talks to Fir'aun. Just study that carefully. You'll find amazing things. Fir'aun will go this way and that way and that way and that way. Didn't you commit this crime? Didn't you do that? Didn't we raise you here? What kind of traitor are you? He goes this way and that way and the other way. And Fir'aun, Fir'aun tries everything he can, but Musa alayhi salam stays on point. He doesn't budge. He doesn't move from his position. But I here I want to sh- tell you something about, else about this narrative, and I think it'll sound familiar to you as it does to me. One, he's a threat to your land. He'll get you kicked out of your land. So if you really love your land, and if it's part of you, it's part of your identity is to love the land that you belong to, and you have any sense of patriotism, then part of your patriotism will be to hate this message. You can't love this message. You can't even be attracted or consider this message because that would be being a traitor to your own country. So the narrative is made that either you love your country, you love your people, you love your tribe, you love Mecca, you love your fellow family members of Quraysh, you love your beloved, your, your glorious history and past, or you consider Islam. Because the two cannot go together in this hijacked narrative. This one or the other. It's painted that way. To this day, I have friends. I have friends that recently became Muslim. You know what they're told by their families? How could you be a traitor to America? How could you do that? What kind of an American are you? You became Muslim? The religion of the enemy? See, how, see what, a, what an amazing job they've done? You've got to commend them. SubhanAllah. That the two things have been made polar opposites. And people are really truly convinced of this narrative. And sometimes we are too. And I don't, I don't actually consider Muslims innocent in this discussion. I think our ignorance has a lot to do with it too. I know many Muslims. When they talk about non-Muslims, they say, I met an American friend today. What does that mean? What about an American friend? What they mean by that is a kafir? Are you kidding me? <laughs> Seriously? You know? SubhanAllah. That we, in our minds also, these two things have become synonymous. We have to first look deep into ourselves and see how, how big a victim we have become of this propaganda. But the, the discussion of Fir'aun and his chiefs is not done. I want to finish the ayah with you. You know what else they said they might do? Why you shouldn't consider this message? وَيَذْهَبَ بِطَرِيقَتِكُمْ الْمُثْلَى Amazing words in the Qur'an. If you listen to these guys, they will get rid of. ذَهَبَ in Arabic, to go. But when it comes with the preposition of ba, it means to remove. They will remove. They will erase. What will they erase? طَرِيقَتِكُمْ Your lifestyle. You know, tariq in Arabic is a path. But tariqa, the feminine form, is a path that you live life in. Lifestyle, it's the figurative form. طَرِيقَتِكُمْ الْمُثْلَى Your exemplary lifestyle. I want to explain the word muthla to you so you appreciate what is being said here. The word muthla is the feminine form of amthal. Amthal is the best possible example you can give. What they are saying is, our lifestyle is so awesome, everybody else, when they talk about the best possible kind of life, they give our example. And these two prophets, these messengers of yours, they're gonna get rid of your perfect lifestyle that everybody else loves. The whole world wants to be like us, and these people want to get rid of it. وَيَذْهَبَ بِطَرِيقَتِكُمُ الْمُثْلَى Does that sound familiar at all? SubhanAllah. There's nothing new. That's the first point I wanted to make, that this, this, this propaganda war is not new. And Allah did not leave us without guidance. He did not leave us without instruction, without His wisdom in how to deal with this propaganda. And how to take the path of Musa alayhi salam as our messenger himself did sallallahu alayhi wasallam. That's the first thing I wanted to share with you. Quickly, the second thing that I wanted to share with you is what do you do? On the one hand, you have a multi-billion dollar propaganda machine which does something in a very synchronized fashion. If you notice some of the buzzwords that are used, they're used across channels and across media outlets and across newspapers that even belong to, and John Stewart does a good job of making fun of that, right? But there's something peculiar about that, that all these different media outlets, apparently independent of each other, are saying the exact same thing. I want to share with you a little bit of the next ayah. قَالَ أَجْمِعُوا كَيْدَكُمْ Firaun says to his ministers, he says, Unify your plot. أَجْمِعُوا كَيْدَكُمْ Unify your plot. Be synced. Be synchronized in your plot, in your planning. 
And then he says, ثُمَّأْتُوا صَفًّا Then come at them in rows upon rows. Come, at the, come against Musa a.s. in rows. Be unified in your attack. ثُمَّأْتُوا صَفًّا وَقَدْ أَفْلَحَ الْيَوْمَ مَنْ اسْتَعْلَى And know for sure, the only one who will succeed today is the one who is able to show his superiority. In other words, your job is not to prove how, how great you are, your job is to prove how terrible they are. That's all you have to worry about. You just have to demonize them. You don't even have to show people how good you are. I was just, interestingly enough, what an interesting weekend I had. I was just in Atlanta. And there's an eradicating Islamophobia conference going on there. And you guys are hanging out, inshallah ta'ala, tomorrow with Imam Zaid, correct? I was just hanging out with him today and yesterday. And one of the most brilliant things he said, he said all this attention on the Muslim boogeyman, who's apparently also your dentist, <laughs> also the guy that, you know, you works at the gas station next door or whatever, but he's like this terribly scary entity. Why all this attention on him? Because you have to take attention from other things. Jobs are shipping overseas, you know. And the, there's enough money in government to put, you know, scanners that apparently aren't even impressive to the Israeli airports. We have money for that. Because there are some special interest groups that are, that are making clear bucks out. And it's not even like hidden news. This is like national news at this point that there are you know, private interests involved and their hand is deeply tied. You know? But attention has to be taken away from that. So somebody has to be a scapegoat. We're the easy target. We really are. But this is the external. Now I'm going to quickly talk about the internal challenge. And I, you know, I, I had a lot of things to share with you guys, but I know I missed my flight and all that stuff. So I'm going to give you the 10 minute version of the four hour thing I was going to do. So see, I'm going to pick and choose obviously. But the thing I want to talk about the most, especially because this is an MSA crowd, you guys are young, you have your lives ahead of you, you have also your understandings of Islam to mature and ferment, you know, you're in the process of developing your understanding yourselves, and you're being exposed to many different speakers, writers, books, you know, blogs, YouTube videos, whatever you, 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 know, whatever you may have. Uh, so you're, you're still developing your thoughts and understandings. And in this time, it is very important that I mention that you need to become savvy. And you need, you, need, you need not be naive. You need to have an open mind. And you need to understand when a game is being played with you. Because it is. I see too many youth today that games are being played with and they don't even know it. What I'm talking about is the exact propaganda that is, Islam is being painted with by certain fringe media outlets. That exact narrative is being duplicated by certain Muslims that are calling for their definition of jihad fi sabilillah. And they're writing blogs and articles and papers, and there are ayat and a hadith quoted one after another, a string of ayat and a hadith, and at the end of which, a call is being made to impressionable, stupid teenage Muslim kids. And many of you are victim to it. Many of you are victim to it. And if you're not gonna do something by actions, and your thoughts, you've already been sold. Watch out for this, this new propaganda. Because what this is, I'll, I'll, I'll break it down very basi as, as basically as I can for you. You know, in genuine studies, whether it's Islamic studies or any other studies, in genuine studies, you never make your conclusion first. What do you do first in genuine studies? You do research. You study. You study the evidences. You study, you, you, you embark upon a quest of finding all the facts you can, and eventually you make your conclusion. Your conclusion never comes first. Is it possible, however, let's just talk about the Qur'an, is it possible that I make a conclusion? I make a conclusion. I want to justify the killing of innocents. I, want to I already have that conclusion. Is it possible I can take a string of ayat, a string of a hadith, put them all together, and make it sound like by the time you're done reading all of this, my conclusion makes perfect sense? Is that possible? It is, and it's happening. This is a disingenuous approach to Islamic studies. But someone who doesn't know any Arabic, hasn't ever sat with a alim, doesn't know the first thing about usul al-fiqh, or the derivation of principles, doesn't understand the intricacy involved in deriving sharia principles, knows, knows, knows none of those things, just knows that this guy quoted a lot of dalil, man. He quoted a lot of ayat, and at the end of it he said, this is what we gotta do. So obviously he knows what he's talking about. If that's the simplistic view of Islam you take, then you are heading down a dangerous path. And so the bit of advice, I know this is going to be a long discussion, but the bit of advice I have for all of you, is that you have to make a distinction between those who are seeking knowledge still, and those who are knowledgeable more than you, relatively speaking, and those who are scholars. I'm not a scholar. I really am not. 
I get, I get deeply offended when people call me Sheikh. I have like eight people call me Sheikh today. I don't know, man. Stop it. <laughs> but it's become a relative term. Everybody's Sheikh nowadays, right? So, but understand, there's a difference between people that are, that are somewhat knowledgeable, that may, may know a little more than you do, and actual scholars. Actual research scholars. You know? And we have to show respect to that. Nowadays, the, the standards of Islamic studies have dropped so much, that we are willing to call pretty much anybody a scholar. Pretty much. And even the institution, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to just say something bold. I, I just have to say what I feel, what I'm convinced of. The academic standards of many Islamic institutions in the Muslim world that are supposedly producing scholars have dropped dramatically. They have dropped dramatically. I've met ulama, for example, from Egypt, or ulama from India, that are like in their 80s and 90s. And when you ask them about the same madrasa they graduated from, what do you think about it nowadays? They say, what we did in like, before we got to the madrasa is the graduate now. You know, the standards have dropped. I met an alim from India, in Ohio, in Dayton, Ohio. You know, I didn't know he's an alim, he just, after the seminar, he just starts talking to me, he's quoting the Zamakhshari, the linguistic, you know, tafsir of Quran. He's quoting it from memory. He's just talking to me, you know, and I was like, where did you go to school? That's incredible. He knows like thousands of lines of Jahili poetry by heart. This Indian scholar, right? And he's just chilling, he lives with his grandkid. You know, he's, just, he's not an imam or nothing, he's just a guy, just, you know, hanging out, uncle. They call him uncle. You know, and he says, yeah, what we did, what we did in the first year, now they do in the ninth year. They do in the ninth year. The standards have dropped. The standards of what is considered a scholar in many institutions has dropped. And in some institutions, it's scary. Wallahi, it is scary. I have met people from institutions that have graduated, that are calling, touting themselves as imam and shaykh and scholar, and are saying all kinds of ridiculous things. But when you sit them down with an ayah of the Qur'an, and you say, can you explain this grammar to me, please? You know, how do you get the translation of this? Uh, nothing. When we become shallow in our study of our own deen, when our own deen studies, and our, those who are supposedly our leaders, their studies themselves are shallow, they're nothing more, more than empty rhetoric, then we're all in a heap of trouble. All of you need to be pursuing knowledge of Islam. But know what the limits of that knowledge are. Know that you don't know everything. Know that فَوْقَ كُلِّ ذِي عِلْمٍ عَلِيمٍ There's someone above, someone who has more knowledge above. You know? Somebody uh, on the way here, I was asked about, you know, whether we can combine Maghrib and Isha. I was like, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not gonna answer a fiqh question. I'm not a faqih. I'm gonna know my limits. Young people have to know their limits. When you're young, you think you know everything. I was there too. I've, I've been there. Believe me. Thank God those videos are not on YouTube. <laughs> so, <laughs> right? So, you know, that, that's a really strong bit of advice I have for you. That our, our narrative is right now being hijacked by trolls underneath YouTube videos and blogger comments on, you know, on blogs and things. And there are a handful of crazies that are bullying all the rest of us and being quiet because they paint us as sellouts or this or that or the other. But understand, if we're true to our deen and we, we, we explain and understand and teach this book the way it's supposed to be taught, there's nothing to be ashamed of. There is no controversy. There's nothing, there's nothing that we need to hide. And so here's my last spiel to all of you. As negative as the environment is, the Messenger والسلام, you have to believe, you have to believe what he had to face was worse. As tough as times are, what he had to go through was worse. And Allah in this ayah that I'm sharing with you, Allah Azza wa talks about the people of the book not accepting. He talks about the mushrikun, kabura al mushrikina ma tad'uhum ilayhi. Surah Shura. It is really big on the people of shirk, they can't accept what you're calling to. It's very hard on them. You know, if somebody else says it's hard on them, they're not going to accept. I'll say, you know what, I'll still try. Allah Himself says it's really hard on them. <laughs> they're not going to accept. Kabula al mushrikina ma tadruhum ilayhi. They're not going to accept. Allahu yashtabi ilayhi man yashau. Allah calls to him whoever He wants. You could try, but in the end, who's going to bring them to Allah? He Himself. He will guide whoever He wants. Wa yahdi ilayhi man yunib. And so this, these challenges are laid out. And then those were external challenges, right? The people of the book, the mushrikun, external challenges in the life of the Prophet. The next ayah, وَمَا تَفَرَّقُوا إِلَّا مِن بَعْدِ مَا جَاءَهُمُ الْعِلْمُ بَغْيًا بَيْنَهُمْ They didn't fall into disagreement until after knowledge came out of arrogance among themselves, out of ego clashes among themselves. People of knowledge will have fights within. This is an external problem or an internal problem? 
This is an internal problem. People of knowledge fighting each other. We see that in the Ummah today or no? We see that problem too. And after listing all of these problems, Allah tells His Messenger just one simple, and as a result of all of this, and therefore, we say and therefore at the end of our speeches, that's the Arabic word fa. And therefore, in conclusion, fa lidhalika, in response to all of that, fastaqim. What, you know, فَلِذَلِكَ فَدْعُوا وَاسْتَقِمْ كَمَا أُمِرْتَ And in response to all of that, you keep on inviting. And you stay firm like you've been told. وَاسْتَقِمْ كَمَا أُمِرْتَ You remain where you are like you've been told. وَلَا تَتَّبِعْ أَهْوَاءَهُمْ And don't follow into their, their, their vain desires. You know what the ayah, you know, you've heard that ayah before, right? Or the, this, this kind of expression before in the Qur'an, don't follow their desires, right? I need you to understand what it means here. It means don't get weak in your call and don't become loose in your commitment. Because if you do, that is their desire. You stop making your da'wah, you stop standing up for what is truth in your speech and in your character. That is exactly what the desire of theirs is. وَلَا تَتَّبِعْ أَهْوَاءَهُمْ وَقُلْ آمَنْتُ بِمَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ مِنْ كِتَابٍ And say openly and clearly, I have come to believe in what Allah has sent down from, from a book. وَأُمِرْتُ لِأَعْدِلَ بَيْنَكُمْ And I have been commanded to do justice between you. What I'm calling for is justice, nothing else. لَنَا أَعْمَالُنَا وَلَكُمْ أَعْمَالُكُمْ We have our deeds. They speak for themselves. وَلَكُمْ أَعْمَالُكُمْ And you have yours and they speak for themselves. This لَنَا أَعْمَالُنَا وَلَكُمْ أَعْمَالُكُمْ You have to understand what that means. People don't understand the ayah in Surah Al-Kafirun. لَكُمْ دِينُكُمْ وَلِيَدِينَ You know what deen means? What does deen mean? Anybody know? That's more than that. كَمَا تَدِينُ تُدَانِ In classical Arabic. Deen means what you get. You're gonna get what you have coming to you, I'm gonna get what I have coming to me. That's part of the meaning of لَكُمْ دِينُكُمْ وَلِيَدِينَ What you're up to, because the surah was Surah Al-Kafirun, right? Your kufr, you're gonna get something because of that. And I'm refusing to worship that kufr. So I'm gonna get something because of what I'm doing too. That's part of لَكُمْ دِينُكُمْ وَلِيَدِينَ Here he says, لَنَا أَعْمَالُنَا وَلَكُمْ أَعْمَالُكُمْ لا حجة بيننا وبينكم. There's no room for. There's there's no need to make a case you against me and me against you. You know what? Let's just do what we're doing. لا حجة بيننا وبينكم. And the purpose of that is don't get tangled into unnecessary debates. Wallahi, they 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 come. You know there are certain elements. There there's a great. By the way, I have to be honest. There's a great majority of the people in this country that are genuinely just not aware of what Islam is. And a huge population among them genuinely curious about what Islam is too. Good people. They're curious about what Islam is. But we haven't gone to the public library and done a seminar on the Qur'an. How about before you decide to burn it, why don't you learn it? Right? We haven't done that. You know, we, we didn't do our job. So we, you know, we have to be honest about that. You know, and there are people who hate us, that's fine. And they're gonna hate us no matter what we do. The Messenger was the nicest guy, sallallahu alayhi wa I mean, you got no reason to hate him. You got really got no reason to hate him. You have to be really despicable to, to hate the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa So, it's not like just because we're nice, they're gonna like us. That's not gonna happen. There are some people that are gonna hate us no matter what. But there's a significant population of the people in this country that are genuinely good. And we haven't done our job reaching out to them. لا حجة بيننا وبينكم Allahu yajma'u baynana wa ilayhi al-masheer. Allah will cause union between us. It's almost a dua in this ayah. Even though it's a proclamation too, eventually Allah will cause union. Judgment day, all people will be gathered. But also means hopefully those of you that are good, maybe may there be union between us. Wa ilayhi al-masheer. And to Him we have to return anyway. And only to Him. It's an open call. It is an open call. I tell you, the Muslim youth in this country, and in, inshallah ta'ala, you guys are pioneers. You don't know the kind of weight that's on your shoulders. And one of the major, major causes of our decline, intellectually, spiritually, you know, and, and a major cause of us not even being aware of our narrative, is our, I, the root cause, I would say, is our distance from Allah's book. We're distant from Allah's book. We don't know what this book has to say. We're not educated in it. When people quote the ayat, we don't know the ayah before they know it. We don't know what surah that came from. We don't know what its actual context was. We don't know how we understand it before we could say, no, 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 they're misquoting it. We don't even know it ourselves. We have to have a campaign of Qur'an education for ourselves. And that would give birth to a Qur'an education for the masses of people. It would do that, you know. So instead of the, the, the entire narrative around this book being, this is a book that makes people kill others and it's craziness and all of that great stuff. 
you know, instead of that, we can call people to, you know what, this is a marvel of literature, this is one beautiful book. Here's a seminar on how beautiful the Fatiha is, open to the public. Actually, and we'll serve pancakes. <laughs> I say pancakes because I just moved to Texas, it's a big thing there. <laughs> on, on waffles, right? So, but this is what we have to, I know you're, I'm, I'm going to stop right now, so almost done. Almost done. Quran education. Take it very seriously. Take it, you know, and I, I'm, I'm very appreciative of efforts like Imam Zaid Shakir, who started a series on, uh, starting from uh, Baqarah. I think he spent quite a few sessions on, uh, uh, on the Basmala itself. I, I hope you take advantage of that. Our podcasts are there. And hopefully there are, there are some benefits on our website, inshallah ta'ala. Other, Imam Suhaib Webb has done quite a bit of work on tafsir. So if you're not the type to read and it helps you sleep, then at least listen. At least listen. Become more aware of what this book has to say. You have to do that. You have a role to play. And your awareness of this book, wallahi, it will open your eyes. This book is not like any other religion. Any other religion you could say, oh you're so lost in the religion, you don't know what's going on in the world around you. Not Qur'an. If you truly study Qur'an, it makes you see the world what it re- for what it really is. It opens your eyes, it doesn't close them. You know? أَدْعُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ عَلَى بَصِيرَةٍ أَنَا وَمَنِ اتَّبَعْنِي The Messenger was told. This is my hadith sabili, this is my path. I call to people with eyes open. أَدْعُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ عَلَى بَصِيرَةٍ With eyes open I call people. With full knowledge, full understanding. We have to be people that understand the times in which we live. We need to understand this book of Allah Azza wa as best we possibly can. And you have to start now, all of you inshaAllah ta'ala, as this massive responsibility rests on your shoulders. May Allah give us the ability to carry this message as it should be carried. In our speech, in our character, in our actions. May Allah make us of those who even if we don't open our mouth, just because of how we kept ourselves, how we behaved at this conference, and how we took care of the trash, and how we left in an orderly fashion when it was done, and how we greeted non-Muslims, and we didn't give them dirty looks. And when the security in the campus was walking around, we stopped over and said, thank you for what you're doing. Just because of that, they'll know there's something about Muslims that's different. That we should carry ourselves differently. You know, the way we act, the way we behave, it should be different. And just because you're angry at what's happening in the world, don't show that anger to your fellow neighbor. They're not policy makers, that's just a guy, man. It's just, it's just a dude that lives next door. <laughs> he's, he's, not, he's not in charge of foreign policy. Okay, so, you know, you, you can be good to your neighbors. Actually, you, ha- you have to be. That's part of our narrative. If we were truly good to our neighbors, there was no, there's no room for the, our neighbor to watch. He could watch CNN all day, he wouldn't hate us. That guy cleaned my snow. I'm not going to hate that guy. He cleaned my snow. I didn't even ask him. You know? And and that's the kind of people we have to become. I pray that we're able to take this advice to heart and really that you are a source of pride for generations to come. I really pray that. That that your parents, their du'as are fulfilled. That you are a source of light in the midst of all this darkness. And I pray that Allah Azza wa protect you from vanity, from not, having, not finding a higher purpose in life, from becoming people that whose only greatest purpose in life is to finish a video game, or to, you know, to keep up with certain fashions, or update your profile, right? That, that you, 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 your life means more than these things. That you're able to find that and commit yourselves to that. And I pray that Allah makes us a people of balance. Barakallahu li wa lakum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa Sorry folks, I won't take more than a minute, I promise. Uh, first thing is, I had decided a couple of years back that I'm just not going to do MSA programs because MSA is just to do anything. Yeah. But you've changed my opinion a lot tonight. I, I really am very glad. Just the level of organization and consistency and, and just hard work I saw here, it's, it's, it's showing, mashallah. So I'm very happy to see that, alhamdulillah, it's, it's uh, revived my spirit and my aspirations for what MSAs can do, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, so that's one. Uh, the second thing, uh, uh, this is basically an announcement for those of you who are considering or are thinking about Arabic studies seriously, uh, that you give us some consideration. Uh, the program is called uh, the Bayina Dream Program, bayina.com slash dream, B-A-Y-Y-I-N-A-H. It's the only program of its kind in the country at this point. It's a 10-month full-time Arabic intensive program and we're, we're trying to make this an alternative to Arabic studies abroad as that's becoming increasingly difficult. Uh, alhamdulillah we started this year, we have a few people from LA also actually in our program this year, we have 60 students all together alhamdulillah and they are now in their fourth month and at this, fourth, at this juncture uh, what, what we're doing right now is they're reading Arabic texts without tashkeel and they're not spoken to in English at this point on campus. 
So they've reached that level of sophistication at this point. Alhamdulillah, they have six more months to go. So those of you that are curious about that and like to know more, registrations for next year, the program starts in September, it runs until the summer. So you, you skip out two semesters, but it's worth about 16 credits in college. So you don't lose it entirely. Uh, those of you who would like to know more, I'll stick around a little bit, inshallah. But you can watch a video about our campus. We basically set up a mini college, uh, brothers and sisters. Uh, those of you who would like to watch a video about it, it, it will be shown here tomorrow. I spoke to the organizers here, inshallah. So look for that tomorrow, inshallah ta'ala. Again, I'll stick around for any questions if you have any. Okay, guys. So I know you're eager to leave, but sit down for a second. We're not done yet.